tonight. Welcome to 107.5 tonight. On this Monday evening, we have two guests in the studio for the first hour of our show. Uh, that is the MEP and Thurrock Independence Councillor Tim Aker joins us in the studio. Good evening, Hello, Tim. Good evening. And we're also joined by the Ilford South MP, Mike Gabes. I knew what I was doing. Uh, we're talking about Brexit on the show this evening. Uh, obviously, this is something that, that I guess both of you are very passionate about. How do you think it's all going so far would be the, the first question. Well, it's a shambles. It's an absolute dog's breakfast. Uh, here we are with the Prime Minister, who, when she became Prime Minister, was sounding like Nigel Farage. I mean, if she had a pint and a cigarette, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> and bit by bit, she has given ground, capitulated, and the whole thing has unwound. She went for a foolish general election, uh, born out of vanity, uh, rather than anything else, created a ridiculous manifesto that gifted the Labour Party several own goals and got a beating. And now she just cannot make a decision. And her cabinet is falling apart. Uh, the Conservative Party is fighting each other again. And, you know, we just <laughs> stood open mouthed and thinking, how the hell could they snatch defeat from the jaws of victory? It seems a very difficult thing to do, but she's managed to do it. Uh, and, Mike, I imagine that you're. you're I'll say disappointed, maybe angry at Theresa May, but for very different reasons. <laughs> I actually, I agree with what, a lot of what Tim's just said. I think, however, the most important mistake that's been made was the decision to trigger Article 50 before you even knew what you wanted. And so we've had, since March of 2017, before she called the general election, um, she decided to trigger in March, even though her government, her cabinet, had not got an agreed position and it's only at checkers that they sort of got an agreed position that lasted about two days <laughs> before you had cabinet resignations and then she's had to row back on what was agreed at checkers because of threats from some of her backbenchers and then yes and then in parliament um uh, we've seen that uh, in in the last few days uh, a uh, an attempt to go round the back of what was agreed uh, in Parliament the week before. This is a mess and the clock is ticking. Because of the decision to trigger Article 50, time is potentially running out. We may well have to get an extension. Uh, Tim, how would you feel about an extension? Do you think that would be necessary or would you prefer a no deal option? Oh, no, we, we're going towards no deal. I mean, you, they're, they're talking it up now. Um, as a backstop. So when no deal does happen, Theresa May can use it as some sort of moral victory uh, to stop the daggers being sharpened because when we're out of this, um, whatever deal we get, she's gone. I mean, the patience will run out and she will be thrown on the uh, political scrappy with Edward Heath and the other foul prime ministers uh, of the Conservative lineage. Um, whether anything does happen with regards to extending Article 50 or not, Mike is completely right. You know, this Prime Minister cannot make a decision. She voted Remain, and rather than say, I voted Remain, we got, I, I have the, my views on what the relationship should be, we should still stay in the Customs Union, she made this bold speech at Lancaster House saying we're out of the Customs Union, out of the single market, and has done absolutely nothing to uphold that. And if you read the, the literature about the referendum and the uh, general election, she cannot make a decision. It's phenomenal indecision uh, that she seems to say one thing and do another as a matter of habit. I can't believe it. And how the Conservatives haven't thought of getting rid of this uh, Prime Minister, you know, but then again the Conservative Party always puts party before everything else and they always consider the next general election before the interests of the country. So am I uh, shocked? Uh, no. Am I surprised? Just a bit. Would you welcome a no deal though? Mm. Would that be your, your ideal preference, regardless Absolutely. of what happens? Well, it's the way it's going. You know, the European Union does want to make it easy for other countries to leave. Uh, not that any are uh, going to leave in the foreseeable future, because lots of them are recipients of EU funds. Um, and when the uh, next European elections arrive, uh, the uh, I dare say some of the sceptics will become a lot more lukewarm towards the European Union when they get in <laughs> and realise what's on offer. Um, 
I think that no deal would be good for us. We are going to World Trade Organization terms um, rather than be tied to something which, with the way they've uh, treated us with you know, the payments and so, all sorts of bullying, you know, I wouldn't be a, want to be a member of a club that treated us that way. Uh, Mike, I'll probably bring you in here. No deal would be an absolute disaster. Our um, economy uh, would suffer greatly. There's been uh, various uh, impact assessments done including ones the government didn't want to publish, but they were forced to publish them eventually. And they show that a no-deal option could lead to a massive hit to public uh, finances. It would damage the trade, particularly large numbers of companies in this country are operating with supply chains that include various different components from different countries. And they have a just-in-time manufacturing model. Secondly, we've got lots of financial institutions, banks, insurance companies in London and elsewhere. People in this area work there and they certainly don't want a no-deal arrangement because there wouldn't be then an agreement about passporting or mutual recognition of standards. Then there's the consequences for the British people who have chosen to live in other European countries. We've got British citizens in Spain, in France, elsewhere. They would all be badly hit if there's no deal. And then there's the issue um, of what would happen to many of the issues to do with Northern Ireland. Um, we have got major complications here. The best option is that there is a deal, but the Chequers plan that Theresa May has put forward is not going to last. There will be f detailed negotiations, but I would argue very strongly that we need to, if we are leaving the European Union, we need to maintain a close economic relationship in the interests of our prosperity and our business. That requires staying in the customs union, and it also requires us having as close a relationship as we can with the EU single market. And that potentially um, is not going to be acceptable to the people who want to crash out with no deal. But the WTO model, the World Trade Organization terms, is not a model that is followed by any real serious country in the world. They are all in regional trading blocks of some kind, of some kind of relationship. And many countries have got um, trade deals with the EU. For example, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, Colombia. We've just signed one with Canada. There are a whole range of trade relationships and the EU's relationships with 60 odd countries around the world. We've got to try and start from scratch if we crash out without a deal. And none of them have freedom of movement, none of them pay into it, none of them have the political uh, four freedoms applied to it, so why do we, why can't we have our own trade agreement? And the anger is that Theresa May squandered two years, um, or, as um, Mike alluded to at the start, could have made preparations before triggering Article 50 to get a trade deal underway because we're in an incredibly strong position uh, to negotiate our own free trade deal and the fact is if countries like South Korea and Japan can negotiate a free trade deal with the European Union so can we. We don't need to be in the political union to trade with it. Well that's true. We, 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 we would be able to negotiate deals if we were outside completely but I would argue that the deals we get because of the strength of the 500 million in the European Union single market are much stronger and if you think we're going to get a nice friendly deal with Donald Trump well then I, I think you, you really you know you're going to be a very seriously disappointed and that the European Union gives a strength in negotiating for European countries in the global bodies that exist and the big economies in the world are the US and China and the European Union collectively. Well we're not going to get a worse deal than Obama's transatlantic trade and investment partnership that um, we certainly opposed and I'm glad that it was uh, it was went too far for the European Parliament it was uh, rejected there and they wouldn't even go near it. Um, I think we're in a position uh, to first of all the people said out of the European Union and all of the leaders of Remain and Leave said that that meant out of the customs union and out of the single Wasn't market. We've all seen Was the videos the of the leaders of Remain and Leave, David Cameron and all sorts, it would have been Jeremy Corbyn but he went into hiding for the referendum, saying out of the customs union and out of the single I've market. Seen videos. And that has got to be upheld. You know, it's I've pointless, I've Mike, us going over the arguments about well, the about the referendum. Of Hannan, you know, of Nigel we, Farage, all we saying we would have 
leave. We would leave. have a, a, a relationship where we would still be in a single leave. market with the European the Union. The Leave side won. We are going to leave the European Union. And that means outside the legal framework. Whatever terms you want to give it, it means completely outside. No, now, it's how how the politicians come to it. Now, there's different ways of going well, about it, but well, I think because we've but she's done article 50 and if she extends article 50 she's finished if we fight another set of european elections the conservative party are finished it's good for you good politics for the 48 percent who want to um vote labor or maybe a couple of those that want to hover around the liberal democrats but for the conservative party's position they're finished if they don't get this sorted the reality is that we had a narrow result in a referendum the wording of which simply said four percent um, a narrow result, 52 to 48. So you want to rerun uh, every general election uh, let, let, that's let, narrow. Me, let, me, let me make my point. You've had a big say. The narrow result, 52 to 48, on a simple question, a which was votes. a simple question which said, do you wish to leave the European Union or not? And the reality is the the question of the relationships with the European Union afterwards, the Northern Ireland issue, the issues of the single market and the customs union, the status of EU nationals in this country or uh, British citizens in European Union countries, the, the, the health insurance card, uh, the studying in up foreign universities, all of those issues were not discussed in detail. And despite all and that, your not, side lost. And, so and stop they, trying to fight they, the last they, war and, and be and, constructive. And, and the reality oh. about democracy is that democracy isn't at one point. And now we know what the implications are then surely we should be able to put the outcome of any negotiated deal to the people for a people's vote on whether or not which they, was the referendum they, they, they only a one point in time apparently well, what are you afraid which of which was the referendum people have fight, changed their fight mind, it again in 40 of? years fight it again in why, 40 why, years why Mike? not why not put the deal to the public well then get yourself the citizens initiative on the ballot paper get a bit why, of direct democracy uh, in the uh, house of commons had, and uh, I'll be out there petitioning we had get out there we petitioning had a, we had a, you're lost we, get over it we had an advisory referendum that oh was it's brought, advisory now. Uh, so uh, the people advisory are just advisors referendum. you're not <laughs> serving the people the, the, the people actually have to do what you say parliament had funny to, way of looking at parliament democracy. had to bring in the legislation to bring about what the referendum had decided it will be parliament that will have to consider in a meaningful vote and that will happen in october or november this year if there is a deal and therefore it's a matter for parliament to decide then whether if we are not happy or whether we even agree with what Theresa May has got if there is a deal that we could put it to the people to endorse and then when you lose again decision. we'll have a third vote and when yeah. you lose again what we'll have a fourth vote and when you lose again know, we'll have a fifth can, vote you know, one, remarkable one isn't it they I'm, say I'm, there's they say no, oh well there's all, no, no, all this there's no money no, for no, frontline services but you want to keep rerunning no, this referendum until you get the answer you want like decision funny way of looking at democracy younger generation for decades to come and there were 16 year olds who weren't allowed to vote in that referendum well you're the parliamentarian you should allowed, have changed the law then they were allowed to vote in in the scottish referendum i put amendments down for 16 year olds to vote i have you know and I, well you I, lost I, that did you ask well, them to I, vote again and I, again and I, again and I, again i put no. down many amendments i changed tried to change the terms of the referendum but but unfortunately but you lost the, where was the, the call to run them again the conservatives pushed through a referendum proposal where we didn't have a threshold we didn't have 16 year olds voting we didn't have the complexities of the issue on the ballot paper so therefore it's a matter for parliament to decide when we've got the negotiated terms if then we get like them. save yourself the energy the, the next referendum. time just make sure you have a referendum where only remainers can vote then you might win i'm gonna have to interrupt two one oh seven five tonight we still have the ukip mep and thorough independence councillor tim Aker. i believe he's still a ukip mep is that correct i sit with the ukip group. with the ukip group and at the ilford south mp let me get that right mike gaves uh, on the show this evening uh, we're talking about brexit obviously We've seen the Chequers deal uh, recently last week. Theresa May's going to take control of negotiations and kind of reduce the, 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 the department for leaving the European Union down to a kind of lesser role. Uh, what, do, what do you think of that decision? Theresa May is going to take control of negotiations. Um, I, if I could go first, I, I think uh, the reality is um, she should have done that in the first place. She ended up uh, where, um, with the resignation of um, David Davis and Boris Johnson. Uh, where, where probably she should have been to start with because if she was determined to get um, a compromise deal um, of a kind which might 
uh, be acceptable both uh, in the in Britain but also with the European Union uh, she probably ought to have had a, a much a firmer grip on it in the first place but because of the, the way that she put three uh, arch levers into those key positions and then just said you get on with it well we saw the fiasco of Boris Johnson as uh, the most undiplomatic foreign secretary the country's ever had um, and that was a disaster waiting to happen and then uh, David Davis uh, stormed out um, apparently because there was another plan which he was working on and um, a man called Ollie Robbins who's the senior civil servant uh, who was working directly to T Theresa May was producing uh, a plan for her and it's quite clear from uh, parliamentary evidence sessions in select committees uh, recently that um, uh, Ollie Robbins was was always in the driving seat mm. and um, now it's been formalized that uh, the uh, the cabinet office which basically is the prime minister is going to take the lead and the brexit department um this new minister dominic rubb is basically going to be subsidiary uh to um to the prime minister so i think what we're getting is a recognition publicly of the reality of what's been going on behind the scenes That's oh it. yes to all those people who came up to me in the 2017 election said i've got to vote Theresa may for brexit well, you got screwed didn't you she's made it clear now that she has no plans for this hard brexit she talked about in the lancaster house speech or through the general election campaign uh she sidelined uh the brexit department which she said was going to be headed by uh brexiteers uh and it's made clear now that this ollie robbins that nobody voted for has been working um behind the scenes to shepherd Theresa May to this soft, weak, wobbly deal um, that no, it's going to make no side happy. So again, it's just symptomatic of the shambolic leadership that Theresa May has been giving the country. Uh, you mentioned that there. Do you think that the Chequers deal, I think it was described, uh, well, David Cameron and Boris Johnson described it as the worst of both worlds. Is that something that you would go along with? Um, yes, because um, uh, you can't care only about 20, uh, 10, 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the economy which is manufacturing um, we are apparently not um, going to seek some deal on the service industry uh, that's going to be difficult the um, position with regard to Northern Ireland uh, they seem to be going back on what was agreed last December um, and uh, it it's quite clear that this whole thing could fall apart without a deal on Northern Ireland and the third thing that I'm concerned about is uh, the whole series although there are areas of some content in this checkers uh, document I mean it's got you know quite a lot of pages and paragraphs um, 96 if I remember correctly um, it, it has a lot of areas that are not dealt with at all. There's nothing about Gibraltar's status, uh, which could be a sticking point later mm -hmm. on with Spain. There's nothing about the other British overseas territory, a little Caribbean island called Anguilla, which borders France and the Netherlands in their overseas territories. That's never not looked at. And, you know, the, the issue of trade and customs is complicated in those cases. And, of course, the big thing in the elephant in the room is the status of uh, British citizens living in EU countries. Will they, if I'm living in France and I'm British will I be able to travel freely to another EU country as I can now or will I only have status in France those kinds of things are very unclear and they will affect people in this country who've got families living perhaps temporarily or longer term in other EU countries none of that is spelt out well bear in mind the border between Austria and Germany is there's no free movement there so it's not all hunky-dory in the EU um, there isn't completely, you know, they, they take and break the rules uh, whenever it suits them. Um, so let's bear that in mind. Uh, but again, I feel that there's some, you know, common cause here is that they're, they're, they have not addressed this as seriously as someone who would actually believe in it and want to see that all these issues are thoroughly looked at and that a deal that respects the referendum result is brought to the British people. And it has turned out to a complete mess again with Theresa May. There's always the law of heightened expectations. This was going to be the big meeting and so on. And it just created a air of, well, that was, wasn't really worth waiting for.
We've obviously talked about the Chequers deal itself. Do you think that the Chequers deal would be able to get through a meaningful vote in the Houses of Parliament? No. So where, do, where would that um, leave us? Um, well, firstly, um, the Chequers proposal is just the British government's position for negotiation. That's now got to be looked at and negotiated. It's got to... Um, the EU has got their negotiator, Michel Barnier, who represents um, all of the governments of the EU in the negotiations. Um, it's then and got. Don't forget for Hofstadt of the uh, Parliament. Yeah, 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 no, I was well. going to make the point. If then there is a European Parliament input as well, um, we let, 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 this process is that we have to get an agreement between the UK government and all the um, EU governments. Um, they at the moment have a joint negotiating position but subsequent to that there's then got to be an agreement by the 27 EU governments um, and by the European Parliament in a separate vote as well as a vote by the um, British Parliament. Um, you ask directly would, it, would this get through the British Parliament? I think not because the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, um, who's our shadow Brexit secretary, laid down what he called six tests. And my looking at this um, uh, document from the um, uh, uh, government is that it doesn't meet those tests. Uh, it doesn't meet them over the Northern Ireland question. It doesn't mean them meet them under the key point, which David Davis claimed he was trying to get, was the exact same benefits as we, as we currently have within the European Union. Now, that is not going to be possible, yeah. especially if you're going to bring in a position where you're not in a customs union or in a single market, and the implications of that for jobs and prosperity. I think Mike's just explained why no deal is inevitable. When you've got the European Parliament that will not uh, move an inch on anything, uh, unless remember they have a we have a vote in that um, the other governments which again the European governments do not march as one the European uh, Parliament aimed its guns at the Hungarian and the Polish governments that you know there is no real unity there the Austrian Chancellor was given a bit of a rough ride over his uh, refugee policy uh, and being in coalition with the Austrian Freedom Party I mean you know you're not dealing with one here so I think that any deal that they provide that doesn't actually say right we're off um it won't get through i, th I think you know they're, they're finally being honest the government and saying that we are making plans for no deal i think they should have made them a damn <laughs> long time earlier um but, but and have been honest and said look this is what this is what we're up against um unless we completely capitulate or ignore the referendum result and decide to stay in um where they'll probably offer us a deal where we've got to join the euro we're going with no deal and they should have been honest and upfront with it from the start but do you think that parliament would find a way to make sure that no deal didn't happen well here's the problem here's know, the thing here's here's the thing the you could have a situation where two scenarios i see and mike's already ruled one of them out um but i could still see it happen is that Theresa may present say watered down checkers after negotiation with barnier um that the labor party support and it's those votes that get Theresa may's deal through because she'll rely on votes from the labor party and any of the Liberals, maybe the Green, to get get it through. So a majority of Conservative MPs could vote against the Prime Minister that gets it through. Or she could turn it into a confidence motion, like John Major did over Maastricht. And then um, that's going to put a lot of pressure on Conservative backbenchers and so-called Brexiteers. What do they put first, their party, career or country? And we'll see then, like we probably did see in the early 90s, where they'll fall in line and do what the Whips tell them. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think the way I look at it, the Conservative benches are riven by divisions at the moment. Um, and I think uh, there are a group of probably 50, 60, 80, and they've already been threatening to trigger a leadership contest. Mm. Um, and I think there are a group of them who probably w want, as Tim does, uh, a no deal, and therefore will vote against any deal at all, almost to try and bring about a no deal. Oh, I've thought that from the start, uh, and, and um, this, and it, there's, sorry to interrupt you there, I've always thought that from the start, but the thing that annoys me is that they're not honest about it. Right. Okay. Uh, you won't get them saying, yeah, I want no deal. 
Uh, they always try and say, oh, the Prime uh, Minister gives us this deal. Whereas so on. there's another group of Conservative MPs, it's probably a smaller group, who would want to stay in the single market, the customs. The NSU um, Yeah. Um, and then there's a further group who are, will try and be as loyal as they can to Theresa May, whatever position she takes. And to, I think it, the Conservatives are divided, but then, to be fair, the Labour Party is also divided. There are a large number of Labour MPs, including me, who basically want to support uh, staying in the single market and a customs union and also believe that any deal should be put to the people um, to, 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 to determine whether we decide it is as good as what we have now. So that if there was to be a referendum on the package, it should have three options in it, not just uh, the Theresa May's negotiated deal or crashing out with no deal, it should also have the option to remain. Now that, that would require legislation. I don't think there's a majority in Parliament for that yet. Then there is the other group um, there are uh, what people, you, you could call them uh, left-wing Brexiteers or Lexiteers. <laughs> They're a very small group, um, but they um, sadly include several people in very senior positions in my party. Um, Thank and, God for that. <laughs> uh, and, and as a result, the Labour Party's position is um, is divided. And so we we have a, a small group of, uh, of Labour MPs who have voted uh, with Theresa May, We've also had uh, um, uh, others who have abstained, and then there are another group of us who voted uh, for single market and uh, customs union and to stay as close as possible to the EU. I think um, when it comes to it, and there are lots of the other voters as well, because there's the SNP, there's the Northern Ireland DUP, there's uh, uh, a few uh, Liberal Democrats, and the, and the one Green MP. So, so Parliament will have, we've had some, some very close votes already, mm -hmm. recently. All the pairing business. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think when it comes to this decisive vote, uh, assuming that Theresa May gets a deal, which I think is not certain at all, it could well not be the case, but then Parliament is supposed to have that come back to us in October or November, and at that point, I think it could be very close, it could be very uncertain. There could be splits and divisions in all parties. Um, and uh, it, it really depends upon the, what that deal says as to whether it gets through. And I, I think it's quite possible Parliament could vote it down. Could do. It's, it's in the hands of Jeremy Corbyn, isn't it? I mean, a man who for the past 40 years has been voting against EU treaties and even the uh, vote to go in, in se or the vote to come out in 75. Um, went very quiet in the referendum and lots of people suspect that was deliberate. Um, I'd love to know how he voted. I think he voted leave. What do you think? He said he voted remain, so I assume you have to believe him. Well, <laughs> I'd like to think differently, but again, we're in a position where you have the Conservative Prime Minister who says she uh, is the best Brexiteer going and voted Remain, and a Labour leader who for 40 years has been voting against the European Union and <laughs> says he's for Remain. You couldn't make it up. We're going to 75 tonight. One final time, we have uh, Tim Aker and Mike Gapes in the studio talking about Brexit. Uh, my, I guess my next question was going to be uh, with with neither party in the, the neither of the big parties, Labour and Conservative, able to agree a position on Brexit. Is there any way that Brexit can be a success? I think Brexit will be a disaster, and the question is how much of a disaster. It's, um, it's certainly, I don't believe it's going to be a benefit to our economy or Britain's influence in the world. Um, the question is how you mitigate the damage. And so if we do leave, I want to try and make sure that the damage is as little as possible. Um, so that's, that will be my agenda for, for the next few months in Parliament. Well from uh, uh, Mike's perspective Brexit can be a fantastic success because as a Labour politician outside the EU you can renationalise railways, you can dump state aid rules so there can be borrowing to invest and uh, state control of certain industries um, was so like Labour still for that Railways in, in Europe are still state controlled Yeah but they, they, they and, pick and, and choose and they so, pick and choose so the rules our, as they so do they railway. pick and choose <laughs> they're not the controlled by the British state they're controlled by companies owned by the Netherlands or the French government. I know, and it's outrageous. It is. It is I outrageous. It is comrade. <laughs> so so what, we must do, what we must do <laughs> is bring them under democratic ownership. control There's of no the railways, the which rail the European Union prevents us the, doing. The, Mike, 
please, please, <laughs> please, please have have a drink. Calm down. So we can we can it's make an incredible water. success. <laughs> incredible success. We can get back control of our borders. And there was a, uh, a statistics out yesterday that said by getting back control of our borders, we'll see wages grow up. Incredible. Great news. Great news. And then we can negotiate our own trade agreements from our own perspective, which we cannot do as members of the European Union. You know, we were told the doubt that it would be if Britain voted leave that days after the referendum that the sky would fall in and David Cameron even said during the campaign there'd be World War Three and all sorts. And we're hearing the same scare stories now. The world isn't going to end. Uh, you cannot, inside the European Union, uh, avoid complete economic downturns. There have been poor economic uh, cycles inside the European Union, as I'm sure <coughs> there will be outside the European Union. But what we can do is be masters of our own destiny. When people go into the ballot box, they can vote for a platform and be fully aware that the people that they vote for will be able to implement 100% of their manifesto. Because at the minute, and Vivian Redding said it herself, uh, and for those who don't know who she was, she was the European Vice President in the last Parliament. Over 75% of our laws come from the European Union. And many people would have heard about Article 13 of the uh, 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 copyright directive that's going through, which will stifle people's freedom of speech on the internet. That will not be a problem outside the European Union. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to be hoisted to something where our, 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 our horizons are limited, or break free and embrace something and be positive about our politics once more. I know what I want. I'm pleased I voted leave. If Mike ever gets his way, I'll do it again and then again and again and again. And I'm sure the majority will continue to do so. There is nothing to be afraid. The scare stories are there because big government will always tell you that they are the masters and you are the servants when we know it's the other way around. When the referendum was held, the British uh, economy was um, one of the fastest growing in Europe and in the OECD. It's now one of the slowest. Um, uh, we've had a, uh, a fall in the value of the pound uh, directly after the referendum. Uh, Im imports are more expensive as a result of that. Um, our economy is not growing as much as it would have done and we've already therefore taken an economic hit and are worse off than we would have been. Uh, the but you idea, think that's even without leaving the European Union and if we leave and we crash out with no deal and all the supply chains are, 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 are um, effective, they're already admitting in the testimony from ministers this week, the new Health Secretary Matt Hancock and the, the new um, Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab talking about stockpiling medicines and stockpiling food. That's what we're going to have to deal with if we crash out without a deal. This will be an economic disaster for yeah, our that's, country. That's Remainers echoing Remainers. You know, Mike, if, your criticisms if, about if the you, economy. If your you, criticism, Mike, you just spoke for a long time. Your criticisms <laughs> again, you know, of the failing economy and so on, you should be saying that's why we need a Labour government. We do not, that, not that, not that. Oh, we should stay in the European yeah, Union. We need a that's Labour that's what we've got. We also you've need got, to stay in the you've European got, Union. you've got politicians whose ultimate loyalty is to the European Union, and they'll do whatever they can, move heaven and earth, scare you, scare the uh, children, and all sorts about the nightmare that's coming. I mean, do you honestly think? Cows will stop producing you, milk if we leave have, the European Union. You, but that's what the government is saying. We'll run out of cheese have, and yogurt. Have you you ever, could not make it up. They think the people they think the people upon, are stupid. Have you and that is why they lost. They told people they told people that the sun, sky was going to fall in and that it was going to be a disaster. And the people isotopes, decided and lots and of people decided the that they were going to get no up and vote for the first time ever. I'm not going to stop speaking, mate. You can let me have my say. I listen to you in silence. Please do me the courtesy. Time. I didn't have you an interrupted you. People were told that they were given the ridiculous scare stories that you're going to lose four thousand pounds, as if Joe Public has got four grand left to spare. They were told these scare stories, and they got out, and people voted for the first time ever, and got registered and voted to leave. And you can throw the scare stories at the British people all you like. They don't trust the political class. They don't trust big business. They don't trust big media. They're smart enough old enough and educated enough to make their own decisions and, and good why, on them for why it. is it then that the medical research organizations are saying that there are real risks if we don't get the uh, isotopes and radiology uh, 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 the the things that are necessary for medical treatments which are all made in the netherlands why is it that the educational trade will not stop and no trade of course trade won't so we stop, can buy but, what we need but, simple and, and and there will be delays if we aren't in a customs union and 
and they'll be stacking up now. lorries. So we'll have to build massive uh, warehouses in this country and stockpile in advance. Well, you've you've already got one. You've already got one. DP World. Big logistics you're, park there. You're, you're we've got, we've got, we've got the we'll super port of DP turn, World. Turn, let's use let it. It needs more capacity. Let let's use it. Let me finish my point. There are already concerns about massive queues at Dover and at Calais of goods coming into the country. They're talking about turning the M20 motorway into a massive car park, miles long queues. If we are not in the customs union, if we don't have access quickly to these goods coming through, we will have to have stockpiles, we will have to have reserves, we will have to change the whole way that our business model works and that's going to be massively disruptive and add extra cost to our goods. We had and companies like, now let me finish, companies like Nissan which have been very successful in investors in this country have already said that there will be big problems. All the country, companies that are dealing with the parts of, for the manufacturing and the unipart and the other parts companies, they are saying there are big problems. There has been a succession of companies, to, including Airbus, talking about the damaging impact of not being in the single market or the customs union. Those are realities. These are real people. You can claim that they're scare stories, but well, these are. people live and work and make money and provide employment in this country in the real world, in not in some fancy Brexit unicorn world where you've got a magic world with magical ideas which are completely impractical. Well, Mike, with your ability to see into the future, can you give me the lottery numbers for Saturday, please? It is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Let's let's turn back a couple of years with the queues, uh, Operation Stack, and the queues at Dover and Calais. That was because of the EU's migrant crisis and refugee crisis, engineered by Angela Merkel. Um, it's it's amazing to believe that inside the EU, it was all you know honey and rainbows and flowers and so on when the opposite is true it is a sclerotic dying economy that is riddled with economic well, inactivity much faster and than we are. and it is it is facing the political we are the doldrums and the, and the, but that's because of the conservatives not because we voted to leave the european the, union the and there are EU. opportunities we can have outside of the, the european Republic, union and if the european Portugal, union want to want to play uh, Germany, games with us on trade there's the new world there's the commonwealth why haven't we got a commonwealth free trade agreement that's a bigger market than the european union that's a growing market more than the european union Demographically, it's growing. The European Union's dying. It's, it's, it's average age is going up and up and up. It is the past. The vote to leave was a vote for the future, and there's lots of opportunities to be had. It's just a shame the politicians aren't grasping it. Well, that is completely fantasy. The Commonwealth free trade area, Australia has already made it very clear it wants to have a negotiated arrangement with the European Union as its priority. India said if it was going to have an arrangement with us, then we would have to relax completely our visa regime. They, we won't get these deals without conditions. We don't get deals with the crap leadership we've got from Theresa May and the politicians that want to be in hoc to the European Union rather than do what's best for the people. I'm going to have to interrupt you. Well, of 107.5 tonight, we're going to finish off our Brexit talk with Tim Aker and Mike Gapes in the studio. Uh, I had two more questions that I really wanted to ask you. The first one was kind of the future after Brexit. We obviously had Donald Trump here recently saying the UK-US trade deal uh, probably wasn't going to happen with the Chequers deal that's on the table. Obviously, then he gave the press conference and said the complete opposite pretty much. Where, where do you stand on that? Do you think the UK will be able to get a trade deal with the US post-Brexit if the Chequers deal was the one that we end up with? Uh, well, we don't know how long Donald Trump is going to be president, but the trade deals with the US are extremely difficult because they have to get congressional approval and there are very, very protectionist pressures in the American agricultural industry and also in their steel. For example, we've just had all these sanctions that um, Trump has imposed on the EU and on China. Um, I, I think the idea that we would have a, a great free trade deal with the US US is always a fantasy and frankly we need the strength of collective 500 million weight to stand up to the US if it's trying to bully us in international trade. I think, well, yeah, just send Farage over there to negotiate it. You know, he was the first British leader to go over there and uh, negotiate it. And I think that you can't preempt what Donald Trump does next. Um, he's 
a unique leader that I don't, we've not seen the likes of before. And I think there's a very good chance we could see um, him winning a second term. The Democrats are all over the place. Um, and they just don't know how to uh, fight him. You know, for all of the talk of, uh, you know, the European economy, the American economy is um, going great guns. So you never know what's going to happen with the next uh, election. Um, do you want a trade deal? Do you want a free trade deal? At least we'll be able to create a trade deal outside the European Union because we'll have people that are accountable to Parliament and the British people being able to do it instead of the Commission. But the Commission uh, has to get its proposals agreed by the Council of Ministers where elected ministers are present and then the European Parliament also has a role within the political processes and we have at the moment elected members of the European Parliament. We do. We indeed. I'm one of them. And exactly <laughs> and therefore the idea that it's all done by bureaucrats and there is no political accountability is not true. And the fact is that we have very few, uh, we have about 12% of the MEPs in the European Parliament and so all of them could vote for an agreement and still the agreement could be turfed out by the European Parliament. The fact is if you want British Parliament to decide to have the final say the only way is we can do that is outside the European Union but that was decided in you 2016. Either, you either get a collective already. deal where you've got more influence or you could have a bilateral deal but you'll probably be in a week we can negotiate and the people made their decision like, no the, the decision our is not the final day, June the 23rd we are still in the process of dealing with next it year. we are we are going to carry on this parliamentary scrutiny of it and Parliament has to decide it with the meaningful vote this autumn where we take it from there so all the power you've got you know all the power as a parliamentarian all the power you've got don't you want to extend that do you know where we can actually decide all of our laws why do you want to be subservient to another institution the people it's voted for you in Ilford South they've been doing it for over 25 years you told me you know they want you to be the guardian of their interests the not reality, to cede power to commissioners and no, European the, parliamentarians the reality, the reality is in the real world we have to work with others on environmental ah, protection. That word, compromise. Uh, we have to work. We have to work collectively on issues to do with Managing peace decline. and security. We have the European arrest, arrest warrant and the extradition arrangements. So you'd have us all, in the euro then. All, uh, we made a decision in this country not to join the euro. We are not in Schengen there was no either. Referendum. And Would you have uh, us in no, that as our well? elected parliament has made that decision. And the reality is, we have the vote. we have the best possible deal at the moment in terms of our relationship with our European partners, and we are about to put it all in jeopardy by crashing out with no deal. Is if you get your way, which will be an economic and political. So, would disaster. you have us in the euro? No, I'm the people. You wouldn't vote to join the euro. No, excellent. Would you vote uh, to um, be in the Schengen? I, I, I no, because um, we, oh well, there'll be queues no, in Dover. It's not. It's no. Mike it's Gabe's plan to leave not, the EU. It's, it's not true. Gentlemen. It's not true. We're winning him over. We are not in Schengen at the moment, and we we still have passports uh, and checks when people oh, come to oh, this country. Oh. But, but the sky hasn't also, fallen in. We also, Remarkable. We also have cooperation with France at the moment. Uh, bilaterally. On, uh, yes. We, oh, uh, that important uh, word, bilaterally. And <laughs> with, and with the Netherlands, but that is part of our our being in the EU and, and there is no guarantee it. that those arrangements will continue in the future. God, um, this this is this is remarkable. It's like we've got to apologise for our portfolio of power that we we can't do anything. It's like the old politics of managing decline. You know, it's Great Britain. The clue is in the name, Mike. Let's live up to it. Let's not stop. Let's stop thinking that we're going down the pan, that we've got to be allied to this, that and the other. You know, we can make deals and negotiate with whoever we want as an independent country. And always remember that that strength comes from the British people. And they're our, they're our masters. And our they tell us and what our to do. Democratic institutions, and 52% told us what to do. institutions and our, our ability to compromise and work together and, give and away, build unity capitulate. And with other people and not to polarise by taking a narrow-minded nationalist view can i ask you obviously on the what's what do you think is going to happen not what you want to happen what do you think is going to happen the day after the two-year time clock is up well i'll, I'll go down the pub celebrate but do you think it'll be we, a glorious day do you think we'll, there will still be in negotiations or do you think it will go we'll to be out. Deal? There, will we'll be, be, there will be, be the there transition will be, period there will be no there'll be no deal um we will leave um the european union doesn't want to cede any ground 
um, the complexities of who has to agree what and what and so on um, mean that no deal has always been on the cards and it's a shame that none of the uh, players at the top have been honest enough to talk about it or make plans for it which has been uh, very dishonest and unprofessional I think trade will continue um, we are we have a massive uh, trade uh, position with the European Union they sell to us much more than we sell to them um, so the, the economic realities mean that things will continue um, all of this scare stories are politically motivated because it is a project is a project to create a one-state European Union um, if if they're allowed to get their way um, we will be in the euro uh, because Brussels will know it can get what it wants we will be in Schengen um, our immigration statistics are already ridiculous high well that's you know that's going to be easy street wait until we are in Schengen you know it can get a lot worse so if anyone is thinking about oh well maybe they're right maybe they're right it can get a hell of a lot worse you know we could we can be Great Britain or we can be you know Greece a, a, a version of Greece which we will be because they will take us in the euro we will be pegged to it we're their cash cow they don't want us to leave because they can fleece us for whatever they can get out of it 52% can't be wrong just get on with it you know I, I, I want I, I, you know I got into this you know into politics because I wanted to get bread out of the European Union but this constant merry-go-round now just get on with it you know we don't need to go over the arguments beforehand because there was a referendum we've, we've had we've had many European elections which played out the same arguments and so on and so forth 52% the, the, the highest mandate anything has ever got bigger than any Labour victory bigger than any conservative victory that we've had to call that referendum illegitimate is to say every election success the successes that Mike has reveled in for the past quarter of a century to say all of that referendum was illegitimate is to cast down every election we've had since the formation of our glorious democracy and we're not going to do that are we Mike right now to answer your question what will happen what will happen the day after what, what I thought would happen um, uh, I, I believe, uh, even though I'm very worried that there will be no deal, I suspect there will be some kind of deal, uh, but it will include, and this has already been flagged up, a transition period uh, which goes to the end of 2020, and it's now clear other transition periods on certain other areas which go to 22 or 23 so it's quite long a long process of the actual withdrawal although we will formally be out of the European Union unless they decide to extend article 50 which is also possible um, in the end of March next year we will still be bound by the customs union and the single market and the uh, in adjudication issues the European Court of Justice for some time after that and there will be a long transition I suspect some of these difficult issues like the Northern Ireland border and some of the other questions may still not be resolved even by the final deal in which case the transition will be almost indefinite and it could take two three four five years and um, maybe even longer to get a final agreement so my view is what what I'd want to happen is that the people would have a referendum to decide whether they accepted the terms if that's not possible then Parliament has got to do it itself but we will I think be in a long transition period to make as smooth as possible so we don't go off the cliff and we don't then have the terrible economic impact that that would have. Just finally, a final question before we end this segment and we, we end uh, your time on the show, both of you. Do you think there's any way that the country can be brought together, the, the 48 and 52% of people in the referendum? Do you think there's any way that all of them are going to be satisfied and have faith in the political system ever again? I think when it's done and dusted, um, it will go back to reds versus blues and go back to politics as, as, as normal. You know, I, I, this has been an extraordinary um, period in British politics. It has been a the nastiest period in British politics, I'm sad to say. Um, and I hope that we, everything calms down and then we look at the opportunities we can have. Um, it's going to be a very tasty general election with what comes next with Mr Corbyn you know knocking on Downing Street um, if Mike and his colleagues haven't got rid of him by then but maybe he might want to uh, 
shed some light on that before the show ends. Um, so there's interesting things coming down the road. But, you know, from, from my perspective, this was settled two years ago. The uh, anti-Democrats in Parliament are just stringing this out because they don't want, don't like the result. <laughs> and they want to keep vote, uh, people voting until they get the right result. Um, which is in step with the European Union's behaviour, look at the referendums in Ireland, you'll keep voting until you get the result we want. Just get it out of the way, get it sorted, and then get on with the business of governing. Um, but I think this has cast a long shadow over future referendums in this country. I don't think we'll be seeing many more of them to come, I'm sad to say. I think um, the referendum and the subsequent chaotic uh, uh, outcome of the process that we've gone through is changing British politics. I don't believe that we will go back to politics as it was. I think there is a real possibility of political realignment of some kind and splits within, within both the main parties. And I also think that it's impossible to predict the outcome of this. Um, the old tribal certainties have gone the um, people, many people who voted um, uh, conservative uh, did so because they were leavers, but substantial body were also remainers, vice versa for the Labour side, the majority of Labour voters at the last general election were remain, but a minority were leave, but um, I think this issue is changing relationships and there is clearly uh, a lot of unresolved issues about where our country stands, our relationship with the European Union in the future, and also um, what kind of country we are. Are we a country that's inward looking and narrow and wants to keep people out? Or are we a country that, as it has been for centuries, is an outgoing country which has an interest in what's going on in our, the European landmass next to us and wants to try and have a, a relationship as close as we can. But the un big uncertainties in all of this is what Putin's doing, what um, Trump's doing, and the threats to our values, our democratic values from elsewhere in the world. And this is the worst possible time to be leaving the European Union. So I'm really not sure where it's going to lead, but I don't think that politics and political parties alignments are going to be the same as they were. Fantastic. Uh, Tim Aker, Mike Gapes, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Uh, I don't know if we've made your mind up one way or the other. I think the only thing we can guarantee is that Brexit means Brexit, unless, unless it doesn't. <laughs> unless <laughs> it means <laughs> saying it. <laughs> uh, and we'll be back on the other side of...